And so it's really important that before you just give your child a debit card, even if you think that they're mature, that they've already had the experience literally holding money in their hands um, or putting it in an envelope, putting it in a jar, a clear jar where they can see the money accumulate. Um, you cannot rush that process. Welcome to the Teacher Money Show, the podcast dedicated to helping teachers navigate your unique financial challenges and unlock your financial superpowers. I'm your host, Sean Morgan, a full-time teacher. That's right, I teach every day, just like you, and personal financial coach. And I'm here to help every teacher, whether you're a seasoned teacher looking for fresh insights or a new educator navigating your first paycheck, have a richer wallet, classroom, and life. The contents of this podcast are informational in nature and are not legal or tax advice. And neither I nor my guests are engaged in the provision of legal, tax, or any other advice. You should not act upon this information without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. I'm super excited to have Christina Cardozo on our podcast today. It's been so great to get to know people from all sorts of places. And Christina is someone that I got to meet once again at FinCon. It's just a great time meeting her there. And she's great. So throughout Christina's journey as a teacher and current role as a math coach, she has unveiled the lack of financial literacy in the school system. She has also learned that parents really want to teach their children about financial literacy, but just don't know how. Christina is on a mission to educate as many parents as possible and empower them to raise financially literate adults. Christina's goal is to bring families together through money conversations and allow the once taboo topic to be spoken about freely at home. She is confident with her education background that she can teach life building skills that will make a meaningful impact on people's lives now and for generations to come. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Sean. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be with another educator. Yes, educators and money unite. I'm so excited for us to yes. do this. <laughs> so we, we mentioned right out of the gate in your, your bio that you're, you're a math coach, uh, but can you tell us just about your background in education and how you got into financial literacy? Sure. So my background in education. So I started off teaching high school math and uh, I was also a part-time adjunct math professor. So I'm a big math geek. Um, and then after doing that for a few years, I ran a tutoring center. Um, but now I say for the last eight years, I've been working as a math coach in the elementary school. So I really have background from kindergarten up until college. Um, so I always have loved numbers. And I will also blame my mom because she's a CPA. And so it was a combination of money and numbers that I always loved. And so she's the one who really introduced me to the topic of financial literacy at a young age. And I was pretty hooked ever since. Um, I mean, at a young age, I had a notebook where I was keeping track of my savings, not really too much expenses, but I had like a budgeting notebook. That's awesome. I wish that I was as uh, early starter as, as you are. That, that's fantastic. And I love how you have a background in education and continue, you know, to, to have that, a background in education uh, because education is so powerful. It's so important. We don't want to lose that. We don't want to push teachers out of education. We want to make teachers as possible to continue in education as long as is, you know, best for them and for, for their students. Uh, and of course, financial literacy is a huge part of being, being able to do that. So today for our conversation, we really want to talk uh, less about in the classroom and more about in the home, right? Uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of teachers are our parents and you you want to learn financial literacy and you also want to pass it on to your kids. Uh, so I want to talk about how we can do that. So why is it important for parents to start teaching their kids about financial literacy from a young age? Yeah, so... I personally, I personally believe that it's never too young to start talking to your kids about money. And you might be thinking, well, my kids don't grasp the concept of budgeting. And that's not really where you have to start. You could start as early as, you know, with a toddler talking about wants versus needs, right? Because when it comes to money, yes, there is numbers involved, but a lot of times, 
what you decide to do financially has a lot to do with your own discipline and your behavior. So just starting the conversation with young kids, toddlers, wants versus needs. I mean, they're already asking for things at a young age. So it's pretty easy to start at that age. Yeah, I mean, yeah, kids are so malleable when they're so young. Right. Yeah. I, I hate to you know be like, yeah, you're molding your child, but like, seriously, you can either push them towards good money habits and good money mindsets early, or you can just not do anything and they'll naturally develop pretty poor money habits just because of the culture that we live in today. So uh, it's very important to start them early. So that way they have those good money mindsets right at the beginning. Uh, as we're trying to, to uh, you know, teach you, you mentioned like, you don't have to start them off with budgeting, you know, at age three, like, all right, this is how you budget and make sure you keep your expenses here and you're, you don't have to do all the, those things uh, right out of the gate. Um, but I'm sure there are some misconceptions parents have other than, you know, I need to start with budgeting or other challenges they may face when they're trying to teach the kids about money. So what are some other things like that that parents need to be aware of? Yeah, so you also reminded me of uh, a study that I had read, and it also talked about um, not only can we start really young with kids, you know, talking about wants and needs, but actually by the age of seven, kids have already de developed skills, financial literacy skills that they can carry up until adulthood. So already by seven, they have enough skills that, you know, they can use as, as an adult. And the reason why is because kids are mimicking what they see, right? So you, as an adult, you might not realize what you are doing, but every day the kids are watching, you know, the way you talk about money, if it's a positive or if it's negative. Um, so I think we really have to watch and be aware of those kind of conversations. Um, what, what, what was the other question was the misconception. So I would say the misconception is in the household is that people think that because they have made money mistakes themselves, they feel like they can't teach about money. You know, they might think, oh, I made so many mistakes with credit card and, and with debt and um, things that they don't want to share with their kids. But believe it or not, by sharing with the kids can just change the trajectory of their lives, right? Because if not, we could have this cycle of repeating these negative patterns because the kids are already seeing what you're doing. So if they're imitating what you're doing, <laughs> you know, you're, it's going to continue that cycle. But you could break that cycle by actually having these conversations and explaining, you know, this was a bad decision that I made. And I mean, you know, we're all into financial literacy but we make mistakes too, you know? And so um, I'm not perfect and I will, <laughs> I will tell my kids, oh, I just made this mistake. And now at this point, you know, my kids are kind of like calling me out on things themselves. Like recently we went to the store and I said, all right, we're going to get a soccer ball. And then right away, I just naturally gravitated towards like the clothing section. And then my son was asking me if I was going to impulse buy. And he's 10 years old. <laughs> yeah. So he's picking up on it and he's keeping me accountable. <laughs> that, that is fantastic. You know, I, I think that, you know, this, like you said, it's never too early to start. And you start with your example more than anything. You know, I... I don't talk to my kids a ton about money quite yet. Like we, we, we do mention it. We want to make sure they're understanding that. But the number one thing that I, I, I make sure I do is whenever I'm doing our budget, which I, I do it weekly, I, I do it where they can see me doing it. Right. Just that one thing alone of seeing like, Oh, it's a habit. Like everyone just, you know, does their budget. That's what they're going to assume when they see me doing that. They'll have that ingrained in them as, as something that you need to do is, you know, check your budget often. Mm -hmm. So I think things like that, simple things like that are really important. And then <clears throat> I really liked how you were talking about uh, having your kids able to call you out. Um, we, we were teaching our kids about that. We, we used a, a book called The Awesome Stuff. I, I had yeah. uh, it on and it is fantastic. And we, we talked about the awesome stuff with our kids. And then I was able to just ask them, you know, is that your awesome stuff? And they say, oh, no, and, you know, like just using those those proper language, that, that right language with them can develop with them that, that, and then they can start asking those questions, right? Ask a regular 10-year-old, they probably don't know what an impulse buy is, but since you've 
used that language and you've kind of modeled those things, they know how to talk about it and then they can engage in that conversation. Yes. Um, shout out to David. The book is called The Golden Quest. And I've also read the book to my kids and it is awesome. And it's funny because I've also had that same conversation. I mean, we're just a few months past Christmas and I would ask the kids, do you remember the gift that you got from Christmas from other people? And most of the time they don't, or they're not playing with it, right? Um, maybe from the parents, because the parents know exactly what they want. And hopefully it's not too many things, because then it's kind of like overload or overwhelming for the kids. Um, but the idea is just making sure that kids realize that uh, you don't need to have so much stuff. We don't want to support this consumerism, right? We want them to be content with what they have. Um, so I think that's a really important skill to to also develop with your kids at a young age. Yeah, I love that. So we've got uh, just, you know, good money habits, good mindset, and, and, and good, um, you know, cap on your, your, your wants. I think those are great things to start with, with young. So if, if you're trying to, you know, maybe ramp this up now. So instead of just, you know, modeling it or talking about it, but you want to really try and get some financial literacy education going, how can you engage or, or make it relevant for children? Yeah. So I would say that, you know, you just gave a great example of how you do budgeting in front of your kids. So one thing you could add to make them a part of it is maybe they're right next to you, sitting next to you. And even if you're just saying, oh, click on this tab or move this mouse, they're literally physically doing something with you. Or maybe you're saying, oh, print this out, or I want you to copy this on, you know, to another document, whatever it is, they feel like they're involved. But besides that, I would say, all right, now you've seen my budget, let's create a budget for you. So whatever it is, we want to make sure that it's relevant to the child. Um, I'm sure that a child does want to save up for something. And so we could work it out where, you know, we figure out how much money do you need to buy whatever item you want to buy? How long could that take you depending on jobs or allowance and so forth, maybe birthday money that they get. Um, so whatever that topic is, just making sure that they can relate to it. Yeah, awesome. So to do this, do you, do you have any strategies or tools that you, you know, use frequently to to engage in that? Yeah. So I there are a few apps out there. Um, you know, you can search around for some apps depending on the age of your kid. I've actually worked with some financial literacy companies. Um, one of the apps is called Toddler. It's spelled T-O-D-L-R. Um, and that app talks about wants versus needs at a really young age, starting at five years old. Um, but there's another app that I'm thinking of. It's called Goal Setter. And that could be for older kids. So that one I actually have for my older son, where he could actually watch videos on financial literacy topics. And he could also like, it's connected to my bank account. So his allowance goes into that. And he could also move money to his debit card from that app as well. So again, depending on your age, you can make it relatable for them. And then you have these conversations with them as well. So the fact that now my 10 year old, he can move money to his debit card and he knows like, you know, I have to go out, do some errands and said, mom, is it okay for me to bring my debit card just in case I see something that I want? And I'm saying, okay, for that. Yeah, that, that's, that's great. I want, I want to talk about that real quick. But you just mentioned like, you know, ways to engage kids uh, young in financial literacy. I, I want to bring up that. I really love this program. It's called Lemonade Day. Uh, it, it's something that I did with my you know, son when he was five. He uh, just ran a lemonade stand, but it goes with an app that has like education. It's like, okay, let's talk about being an entrepreneur. And it like breaks down each steps you need to run your own business while running a lemonade stand. And um, it, it's like it was sponsored by a local business. So uh, it's like a national thing, but like local businesses, like a, like a local grocery store, but like a chain uh, was sponsoring it. And, and we were able to go out in front of that grocery store after we applied to them for, you know, the permit to, to use that space and, um, you know, sell lemonade. And then we did accounting on like, where'd you get the money from? You know, you have to pay your parents back for that. And okay, then you have to pay for your supplies and you have to pay for, you know, this or that you have that we had to pay for the space from the the uh grocery store 
and then, you know, whatever's left is profit. And we're able to discuss how to use that profit for, for his bonds needs and so forth. It's just a fantastic program. Very well done for, for, you know, kids of almost any age, I think. And a, a cute kid running a lemonade stand in front of a grocery store makes a ton of money. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous <laughs> right. how much money he made uh, <laughs> selling lemonade. But it, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, so I'd recommend that one. Uh, anyway, I really want to talk to you about uh, the debit card. You have a 10-year-old with a debit card. How early do you feel like is it like you usually give a kid a debit card? And, and why did you make that decision? What are your thoughts on that? That's a great question. And I'm going to talk a little bit as a math educator, um, because nowadays, money in terms of the physical currency, people are not really using, right? And so it's really important that before you just give your child a debit card, even if you think that they're mature, that they've already had the experience literally holding money in their hands. Um, or putting it in an envelope, putting it in a jar, a clear jar where they can see the money accumulate. Um, you cannot rush that process. And I say that because as a math educator, when we teach simple concepts such as adding and subtracting, the kids start off in kindergarten literally moving manipulatives. So they have to physically touch something. They need to have that one-to-one -one correspondence in order to grasp what adding and subtracting really is. By the time they get to fifth grade, you know, they may have some mental math or they might just be doing a series of steps, the standard algorithm. And that is OK because they've had years of experience, but it is really abstract. And so a debit card is really abstract. And so I would say, again, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean the age. It's once you realize that your child has understand the concept, like you feel confident that your kid understands the concept of, you know, money coming out of an account if it's not too abstract i would say maybe somewhere around fourth or fifth grade if not maybe it might be middle school before you do that and you're literally giving them money physical money um up until that point that they get there yeah that that's a, a good point adding i as not an elementary educator i had not even considered the importance of the manipulative piece i mean i have my kids use manipulative money just because they're too young for a debit card and I, but like just making sure that they understand that concept. But, you know, we usually like, you know, you know, I'll, I'll use a credit card to make a purchase uh, just because like we, when we like go out to uh, a place where they want to like use their money, like I'm also buying something and it's just really convenient to, to swipe, but, you know, we'll make sure that like, okay, we're, you, you, you paid this much. And then like, we, we give them change. Like we, we do a lot of like, you know, they, they still hold the money, still use the money. So mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's really important that they, they, they're using the money as much as possible. And then, you know, um, we, we've also made sure that he, they give the man the money at the counter and he counted yeah. the change back and they're so excited about that. So <laughs> I would say don't don't rob your kid of the excitement of paying for something with 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 cash. They they really enjoy it. Yes, yes, they do. I have a six year old and he he we went to Walgreens <laughs> and he brought he asked me if he can bring some money. I didn't realize he was bringing all the money that he had. <laughs> he tried to stuff it in the envelope or put it in his pocket. And then, you know, the item that he wanted, and mind you, this is like a convenience store in a way. So things are going to be more expensive than like a Walmart. Uh, but he didn't care. He wanted a soccer ball and he was spending almost every dollar he had just to get the soccer ball that he saw at the convenience store. Mind you, he has at least 10 more soccer balls at home, but he was still so excited to, for that experience. Yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Uh, no, I'm just imagining like nickels and stuff being thrown on the counter to buy the soccer ball. <laughs> uh, so you talked about abstract concepts, right? Budgeting, saving, investing are pretty abstract ideas. How can you approach those types of things in a way that a kid's going to understand it? Yeah, so funny. So I will say the reason why I also started educating other people on financial literacy was due to my son. He kind of sparked this inspiration, I would say. And it all came out when we were in the car and my son told me this was around 2020. So he was seven. And he told me that he wanted me to open up a brokerage account for him and he wanted to invest. And I remember being in a car and turning back my head and I said, 
what? You want to what? <laughs> you, how do you know about a brokerage account and investing and so forth? And uh, he told me, yeah, mom, I want to invest. So again, this was 2020 time when I'm listening to a lot of podcasts because I'm like, well, you don't have much other thing to do, but to be around the house listening to podcasts. And so I was listening to a lot of financial literacy podcasts and he was picking up on so much stuff. So I wasn't really, I wasn't lecturing him, you know, it was just, it's open. We're having conversations and he's able to pick that up. So since he, it was his idea for me to open up a brokerage account, I did uh, just a taxable brokerage account. Um, I pay $1 a month for it. Um, but the whole idea behind it was for him. He literally gives me money <clears throat> and I will put money into that account for him to see the growth and see what will happen. So it's not like a huge chunk of money. Um, and it's really just for the experience for him to see what happens. So I had asked him, what do you want me to invest in? And he told me Tesla. And I was trying to teach him about index funds. And I was trying to teach him about diversification. And he goes, but I really just want to invest in Tesla. And I'm like, okay, I'll let you invest in Tesla. But we're also going to invest in an index fund. And I was trying to explain that to him and so forth. So anyways, a few months later, he was, he was like, can I, and every few months he asked me, can I look at my investment account? He never asked to take anything out. I said, we're just going to see what happens. We're going to see the growth of it. So anyways, a few months later, he asked to see it and his Tesla stock just shot up. He was like, man, mom, if I would only put all my money into Tesla. And I was just thinking, why didn't I put more money into Tesla at that time? <laughs> So yeah, the idea is just like letting them experiment. Um, again, it's not like a huge chunk of money, but they're able to see a significant amount of growth. You know, for him now, years later, he's like, wow, my contribution has doubled. And that's a lot of money, you know, his dollars, if it was sitting in a piggy bank or in a jar at home, it's not growing. But having it in an investment account, he is literally learning the power of compound interest. I love how you're just showing him. I mean, like, yeah, at first he he was just listening, but just saying like, hey, look, you invested this money. This is what happened to it. Uh, I mean, naturally that makes a kid want to invest when it goes up. Have you had any experience with it going down yet? Has, has Tesla taken a, a dip for him and has, has he felt that? Overall, not now, you know, since the time that he started, but right from the beginning, he did notice, oh, it, it dropped a little bit. And I said, it's okay. You know, it's going to continue to go up. We're just going to step back and we'll look at it every few months. We're not going to be obsessed about looking at it all the time because in the beginning he would want to look at it more. Um, and I'm like, that's not really how it works. You want to make sure that you just, you're not playing around. And these are things that I've learned myself because I've been anxious. And when I saw money drop, right when I was trying to learn about um, just taking care of, you know, investing on my own, there was times that I pulled out money when it had <laughs> dropped. So these are experiences that I've learned, but now I'm passing on those mistakes. So he doesn't do the same thing. Yeah, that, that's awesome. Uh, I kind of want to open up a brokerage for my kids now. And like, seriously, I like a seven-year-old investing even like a hundred bucks, right? is going to do so much in his life compared to you know, 30 or 40 year old investing that same a hundred bucks. So that right. start them early and there, there's a lot of benefits to that. Right. Um, complete side tangent. If you can get your kid working for you in like a side business of some kind in any way, that's kind of meaningful somewhat, even at that, like a pretty young age, you can then start investing in like a, a Roth IRA for them, which is, pretty incredible talked about this with erica terry uh it's fantastic conversation talking about how you can uh, you know get your kids involved in a side business an edupreneur business right because you know every teacher can run a business in education in some way and if you get your kid involved you can pay them at you know a regular wage and put that money into a, a roth ira it reduces your taxes because you're paying you know, wages out of a business they don't have to pay taxes because they're not making $24,000 a year. So you get a tax benefit and they can start investing quite early.
Yeah, so this is actually something that I did with my oldest son. I still need to create one for my youngest son. Um, but we also have a real estate business. And so many times he is helping assemble furniture or, you know, taking the drive with us and, and still helping out. Um, and so I told him that any money that he's going to get from helping, I'm, I already told him, I was like, I'm putting this into a Roth retirement, a custodial Roth retirement for you. So it was kind of a non-negotiable. I'm not giving you the money for working because you get money regularly, you know, with your allowance, but this money for working this specific job that I made you an employee, that's going to towards your Roth. Yeah. I mean, like the government doesn't care if you take all of their wages and put it into a Roth IRA and then as a parent gift them that exact same amount of money for just being their parent, right? Like they're, right. You, you can say these are wages, Roth IRA and good job for working. Here's some, you know, here's a gift. Like you, the, you're a parent, you can give as much money as you want to your kids without them working. So there, there's just a lot of benefits to doing that. Yes, definitely. All right. With these, you, you want to teach you know, the kids about financial literacy and your teacher as well. So you probably want to get to as many other kids as possible. Is there any way that you could apply these strategies to a classroom setting to try and you know teach financial literacy to your students? Yes. So I personally don't have a class because I'm a math coach. So I work more with teachers. Um, again, I was a high school math teacher, so I did have class in the past. Um, but what I will say when it comes to really any age is I will say kids are learning about this information now more than ever before. Um, I would definitely say middle schoolers and high schoolers, as soon as they have a phone, they're looking at things online, right? Or even my son who doesn't have a phone, he's looking at things on the computer. He's going on YouTube and he knows about people who have a lot of money. You know, he'll talk about, oh, this is so-and-so and he has, he's a kid and has a million dollars. Um, and so the reason why I put that out there is because you as a parent or as a teacher, just this adult figure in a kid's life, want to be there for the kids to be able to answer questions. So I would really encourage you guys to just make sure that you are also on top of things, like make sure you're educating with what's current, right? And so one thing that I like to do is I go to other schools and I teach, I do workshops for high school um, teachers that teach financial literacy and business. And one thing that I may stress, may stress are things that are relevant for kids at the time. So let's talk about cryptocurrency. Let's talk about the metaverse. And that means I'm now having to educate myself on it. But it's because I know kids have these questions. And these are not things that teachers are taught, right? There's no curriculum right now that's really talking about the metaverse or cryptocurrency. So we have to make sure that we as educators, we know how to give the right answers because the kids are already learning this stuff or they're already hearing, let's say, they're already hearing these things, but you want to make sure that they don't go down the wrong path because they were, you know, influenced by the wrong type of people. All right, that, that's a good, good point. So just keeping up on it. So that way, as the questions pop up, as it naturally pops up, you can answer those questions and, and engage them in that conversation. I really yeah. like that. Um, so if you are a parent or a teacher, or you just want to, you know, get your kid learning about financial education today, what's, what's the most important first step, would you say? Yeah. So I would talk about behavior, right? So, and this could be a young kid talking about wants versus needs, or this could be an older high schooler and you're talking about delayed gratification. So I think if you can really stress that. Um, besides, of course, being open about money conversations and kind of being like, you know, I, I use the term financial role model a lot because I think that kids need to see what you are doing. You know, like you had already mentioned, you are budgeting in front of your kids. You are setting that you are setting that model of what it means to budget because so many times people tell us, oh, don't do this or budget. But if you've never actually seen it, or you never experienced maybe different kinds of budgets, right? Like, do I budget on an Excel sheet? Do I try an app? Do I do it, you know, in a notebook? Like, if you never have experienced that, it's going to be a struggle for you as an adult. Yeah, awesome. 
Thank you. Okay, so we're wrapping up now. Just got a couple more questions for you. What is your number one tip to, for teachers to have a richer wallet, classroom, and life? Yes, so I will say work-life balance, but I know that's really hard as an educator because I've been there. Um, I'm a little bit more fortunate now as my role has you know, changed as a, to a math coach. And I say that because I know what it was like to do lesson plans on the weekend and to be grading papers after school and so forth. And I know that's a challenge. Um, but I think between like having a, you know, trying to have a good work-life balance and also really planning for the future. I can't tell you how many educators I've met and they just ask me, oh, so when can I retire? Like they really have no idea. They, they know that they need to put in 25 years and they have to be a certain age, but they don't know that they could possibly retire early or they don't know how much money they haven't done those calculations. So I would say really creating a plan, taking time to educate yourself, listening to podcasts like this, um, but creating that plan. I'll never forget this one math coach. She had just retired a few years ago. I had asked her, so what's going to be your monthly, you know, pension payments? And she's like, I have no idea, but she was retiring. So sometimes they literally just wait until the age of retirement and then just see what happens, you know? <laughs> and I think that's just the wrong way to go. That That's how you end up being the Walmart greeter. If, if you don't pay attention to your retirement, you're, you're going to end up having to get some job part-time afterwards because you're not going to have enough. Right. Okay. Last question for you. How can teachers get in contact with you? Yes. So I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and yeah, that's pretty much it. And what's your handle? <laughs> yeah. My handle is she runs the numbers on Instagram and on LinkedIn. You can just find me by typing my name, um, Christina Cardozo, just to make sure you spell it right. Um, but I know we'll have like the notes at the bottom and yeah, I would love to talk to fellow educators. If there's anything that I can do to support or help you on your financial journey, I would be happy to have a conversation. Thank you so much, Christina. If you want to get that information, you don't want to go looking for it or trying to remember what she said and type it in. Of course, you can go to teachermoneyshow.com slash podcast. You'll be able to find all the show notes there. Uh, and I'll also link to uh, the episode with Eric Terry that I mentioned on, on the page for today's episode. So you can find everything on that page, uh, teachermoneyshow.com slash podcast. It was a lot of fun having you on the show today, Christina. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. If you'd like to come on the podcast for coaching, to share an expert opinion, or just to talk about a topic you think is relevant, I'd love to talk to you. Just fill out the form at teachermoneyshow.com slash guest. I look forward to talking with you.